first of all, thanks very much for coming, and thanks to uh, Catherine for that uh, very generous introduction, and also to Morgan for arranging this. It's uh, definitely nice to see so many people uh, attending a lecture on Freemasonry. So, so my uh, talk tonight is titled uh, Freemasonry and Traditionalism in, in the East and West. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about traditionalism and a little bit about Freemasonry, and we'll probably go off at a few uh, hopefully interesting tangents. So for those who don't know, traditionalism was a, essentially a spiritual philosophy uh, put together or founded by uh, uh, René Guénon, who was a French uh, spiritual thinker and actor in the uh, first half of the 20th century. And um, he was involved with uh, fringe masonry, with uh, theosophy, and uh, various other things. Um, traditionalism has some things in common with uh, Freemasonry, uh, and some things are, are different. Uh, it believes in the esoteric and the exoteric, which is obviously uh, entirely Masonic, uh, uh, and in other spiritual tr traditions as well, such as uh, Sufism and Tantra. Um, but there are some dis fairly distinct uh, characteristics. Uh, it believes that there is a primordial tradition or a, pr a primordial religion, um, which was the, which came from uh, God essentially, and um, is sort of manifest in the different religions of the world uh, today. The major religions that is, such as Islam and Christianity, and uh, perhaps even Buddhism uh, and Hinduism, um, and these uh, these religions are, in a certain sense, a kind of reflection of the primordial religion. <coughs> And um, so one thing that distinguishes traditionalism from uh, say New Age spirituality is that again on thought very strongly that you had to essentially adopt or move into a, a traditional religion such as Islam or Christianity. Uh, whereas uh, New Age spirituality or the kind of spirituality we see today uh, says you can take a bit from Islam and a bit from Buddhism and a bit from Christianity and sort of put them together. But that's actually something that uh, uh, traditionalism is uh, very much opposed to. Uh, so I wanted to um, first of all ask, uh, is traditionalism important? Um, and it's a very small um, philosophy really. I don't think there are that many people saying that they are traditionalists. But um, it's surprisingly uh, influential in the world and, and has been influential. Um, uh, Mark Sedgwick, who wrote the book, A Revolt Against the Modern World, which is about traditionalism, uh, he, he says that Gaynon's actual philosophy was not original, and that it was a, merely a synthesis of uh, different ideas that have been uh, floating around the West for a long time in the, in the spiritual milieu. But uh, he does point out that um, a traditionalism uh, had a, a significant effect on uh, many uh, important uh, thinkers uh, since since uh, Gaynon, and uh, among them are uh, Mercia Eliade or Mercia Eliade, as people often say, uh, Julius Avola, who was um, a traditionalist thinker. Uh, we'll get back to him, and um, and uh, uh, Alexander Dugin, among mm -hmm. others. Um, uh, just return to uh, Gaynon for a moment. Uh, as I mentioned, he was involved in all kinds of uh, spiritual uh, movements, especially theosophy at one point, which he later turned against. And um, he was also involved in Catholicism growing up, but uh, felt that Catholicism had become uh, too liberal. And um, he moved into sort of fringe masonry. He was a member of the uh, primitive and original rite of, uh, of Swedenborg. And, um, and was involved in that kind of world. He, he wrote for a, a Masonic uh, magazine, but he also wrote for an, an anti-Masonic magazine at the same time. So he was a kind of a contradiction in many respects. But uh, he, his ideas have had, um, as I say, a surprising uh, influence. So I'm sure most people here know Mercia Eliade, who wrote the book uh, Shamanism. He's written books on yoga. And he's uh, one of the more important anthropologists. But uh, uh, Iliade was actually uh, very strongly influenced by traditionalism, and especially this idea of um, there being a primordial religion or a sort of primordial revelation, which appears in a maybe perhaps a slightly watered down form in, in the major religions. And um, uh, so his book, Shamanism, 
for example, which I read many years ago, uh, he tries to look up the, um, the sort of defining characteristics of shamanism throughout the world and to find similarities. And this almost certainly is because of his interest in uh, finding the primordial uh, revelation, the original uh, spiritual uh, revelation that mankind received. Uh, so that would certainly be uh, one way in which uh, uh, traditionalism has had an effect on academia and also um, influenced a lot of early um, uh, scholars of Islam in the West as well, uh, particularly in Britain actually. And one of the major scholars of Islam today, uh, Hussein Nasser, uh, he's actually a traditionalist as well. So, so it's had quite an impact on the sort of spiritual, intellectual world. Um, uh, Moshe Eliade is kind of an interesting character because he, like many traditionalists, uh, kind of takes issue with the modern spiritual uh, milieu of uh, being able to uh, mix different um, spiritual paths or religions together. And it does have a kind of traditionalist uh, approach to things. And he, uh, of Freemasonry, he says that, that it's the, uh, quote, the only secret movement that exhibits a certain ideological consistency that already has a history and that enjoys social and political prestige. And I, I don't know how much he uh, really thought of Freemasonry, but uh, he seemed to have um, a slight issue with uh, the modern spiritual world, including uh, modern occult groups. And this probably is a reflection of traditionalism that you have to move into a, a, a traditional religion, uh, not something like Wicca, but something like Christianity or Islam. And, um, and as I mentioned, there are other people that, are, that have been influenced by uh, traditionalism. Uh, one of the most controversial is uh, Julius Evola, who was an Italian occultist and uh, uh, to a large degree a kind of political activist, uh, mostly associated with the uh, extreme right. And um, that's not to say that Evola uh, agreed with everything on the extreme right, but he believed that he could sort of nudge it in a more traditionalist direction. And traditionalism tends to be uh, quite conservative. But uh, he's probably one of the more notorious traditionalists. Uh, uh, he died some time ago. Um, probably, probably one of the main uh, traditionalists today is Alexander Dugin. Uh, he's actually been called Putin's brain. Uh, probably unfairly, but uh, he's a, a very influential <coughs> political theorist in Russia. And uh, definitely does have an influence on the Kremlin and what's thought in the Kremlin. And uh, his main ideology is uh, Eurasianism. And um, you may have noticed that uh, Putin has actually, over the last few years, tried to create uh, what's called the Eurasian Union, uh, which is kind of, um, uh, in a certain sense, similar to the European Union uh, eventually. But it would probably have a very different philosophy and a much more traditionalist philosophy. So. Um, with, uh, with, uh, with, um, with traditionalism, so I've briefly gone over, I'm going to start talking about Freemasonry and then we'll uh, look at some more connections. So I think probably almost everyone here knows what Freemasonry is, but um, to give a very, very, very brief history, obviously, uh, well, I guess I shouldn't say obviously because some people might disagree, but generally, uh, the generally accepted history says that Freemasonry came out of the Stonemasons Guild and uh, of, of Great Britain. Uh, there's some similarities to other guilds <coughs> in uh, Europe, uh, but um, uh, in terms of texts, there are uh, sort of mythology associated with uh, Freemasonry or the craft going back into around the, the early 15th century. And uh, uh, in 1717, as I'm sure you all know, is the, the date that's typically given for the sort of official beginning of Freemasonry. That's when four lodges came together to create a grand lodge and. Uh, essentially, uh, that's the beginning of um, what we think of Freemasonry today, or what some people call modern masonry. Uh, when it moved into Europe, in particular, uh, it went from a, a system of uh, three degrees based on the Stonemasons Guild and the Bible and um, natural law philosophy and sacred geometry to some extent, to uh, creating uh, lots and lots of different rites, many of them were competing, and uh, lots and lots of different 
degrees or, or rituals within those rites. And um, they, of course, drew in uh, different influences from uh, alchemy to uh, Rosicrucianism, uh, chivalry and knighthood, and, uh, and so on, and sort of brought these different, um, different influences together. And then later on, this uh, sort of mixture of um, ideas influenced um, modern occultism, uh, especially the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, the Order of Templi Orientis, and uh, Wicca, which is a sort of new, new age uh, pagan uh, religion. But a, a lot of its language is uh, taken from Freemasonry, as well as from, uh, from elsewhere, from the Golden Dawn as well, and from Alistair Crowley. So uh, I think what's interesting about Freemasonry in relation to the occult is that it sort of, it gives it a new beginning. It's not really uh, a sort of solitary uh, pursuit that uh, one person might be doing uh, with some grimoire from a few hundred years ago, but it, it becomes a kind of group activity. And it becomes a much more theatrical uh, event with rituals and uh, costumes and uh, this kind of thing. Um, so, so as, a, as, a, as Freemasonry spread, spread into Europe, it began to explode in terms of the number of degrees, the number of rights. Many of them were competing. Uh, some of them were in some kind of relationship together. Some of them were considered legitimate and some not. And out of those, you also get other uh, organizations appearing, such as the uh, Golden Rosicrucians, uh, in, in sort of relative uh, safety and privacy. And um, so some of them uh, form their own societies based on Freemasonry, and some try to literally use the lodges to, uh, in a way, sort of foment uh, revolution. Uh, one of the societies that was based on Freemasonry was the Paramushkana, and uh, which means House of Oblivion or House of Forgetting, and it was founded by Mirza Malcolm Khan, who was a Persian, and he had actually been uh, initiated in a sort of a mass initiation in uh, France the, the year before, and this is around the, the middle of the uh, 19th century, and then tried to found his own uh, society in Persia. And his idea was that uh, uh, they would use this to sort of fight off colonialism, but they would uh, try to spread the ideas of the West that were sort of beneficial, uh, such as scientific thinking. Uh, through this society, but as a way of keeping out the uh, West. And there were other figures uh, as well that were important. Um, Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, um, he joined a, a, a several lodges <coughs> in Egypt, and he founded his own national uh, Grand Lodge in Egypt as well. And he was a, a, a very uh, serious uh, political agitator during the middle of the 19th century. Uh, he, he was uh, exiled uh, after, after agitating um, in Egypt and um, uh, seemed to have spread some tentacles uh, quite widely. Uh, he's probably involved in the, uh, uh, the killing of the Shah around that uh, a little later on, or at least his society was. And um, so Freemasonry and Islam sort of merge in this sort of strange way. And, also, not just in the Middle East, but also in the West. So, in, in uh, sort of uh, sort of more black nationalist movements, such as uh, uh, the, the Nation of Gods and Earth. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's also called the Five Percent Movement. Um, there's maybe some uh, adoption of Masonic and, and Islamic ideas. Um, it came out of the Nation of Islam, and I actually met a, uh, a member of the movement a few weeks ago. And uh, he was talking to me and he said that uh, they actually call uh, Freemasons or Masons, they refer to them as uh, Muslim sons. So, and it seems like the, the, that was a term uh, used uh, sometimes in the nation of Islam as well. So, and it's not, it's, uh, it seems to be like a, a fairly widespread term actually within that movement. Um, so I, wanted, I don't want to get too caught up in dates and uh, and specific people, but uh, one of the things I wanted to do was to, uh, to sort of pose the question, really, that um, it strikes me anyway that from the opposite uh, side, perhaps, 
we're kind of facing a similar situation to uh, people in the Middle East uh, in the middle of the 19th century when um, uh, they were a much more traditional society than we are, obviously. And uh, they suddenly found themselves, to some degree, having to deal with the modernity and the West and uh, colonialism and uh, scientific, uh, as we understand it, scientific law and so on. And um, finding perhaps that their, their cultures were being undermined by these, these new and foreign ideas. And in a certain sense, so the, you know, they had to try and balance uh, tradition and modernity. And I think now we also are trying to do the same thing, but from the other side, though, we're a very quote unquote modern and quote unquote progressive society. But uh, we're also having to uh, reconsider tradition, uh, especially in regard to Islam. So, you know, uh, perhaps particularly in Europe, uh, there's the idea that we want to be progressive and we want to be uh, to have all the women's rights we can and so on and so forth but, but what does that mean in regard to the hijab or something is that an extra woman's rights or is that uh, a reduction of women's rights and i think that perhaps uh, this is one reason why traditionalism is sort of uh, rearing its head in a way i mean especially it has to be said uh, on the right wing of the political spectrum and that's partly because of uh, the influence of traditionalism on uh, uh, Julius Evola, uh, who influenced uh, a lot of uh, uh, right-wing parties and right-wing thinkers, uh, especially in Europe um, over the last few, few decades. Um, I would say personally that uh, I think the fusion of uh, uh, traditionalism with some, some right-wing movements is, a, is kind of a stretch. And it's sometimes brought into uh, kind of prop up ideas that are not very traditionalist. Now, Gaynon himself was actually completely opposed to the idea of politics, or at least being involved in politics if you were a spiritual person. And uh, that was actually one of the things he disliked about uh, theosophy, which he seemed to believe was a kind of uh, uh, spirituality that had become fused with uh, communism in his view. And he was a, again, you know, obviously a very traditional, uh, slightly not backward thinking, but certainly somebody who looked to the past for inspiration. But um, one, one, um, one interesting lecture I came across recently was by uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, uh, who gave a lecture at Cambridge University on riding the tiger. And um, riding the tiger is uh, a phrase that it didn't originate with Ebola, but uh, it's probably known today because of Ebola, uh, who wrote a book on that title. I think it's uh, originally a Chinese saying, and the idea was that you shouldn't get on the tiger because eventually it's going to throw you off and eat you. But um, Ebola used it in a different way, and that was uh, the modernity was this kind of tiger, this kind of beast, and that we, the, the traditionalist has to basically ride it until the animal is exhausted and then he could he can get off. I mean, I don't think it's a great metaphor because uh, it's not clear what he's getting off in, onto. But, uh, but anyway, so Sheikh uh, Murad gave a lecture where he talked about um, uh, Ebola and riding the tiger. And, uh, and just, just to quote from that, he says, uh, Ebola, somebody who is in many ways inimical to an Islamic perspective, is nonetheless someone who has had a very significant role in triggering the counterculture. It's not a left-wing counterculture. It's not a right-wing counterculture, but it's a counterculture uh, which has continued to this day and which unfortunately has moved in the direction of forms of xenophobia. But nonetheless, his discourse and the discourse of that cloud of thinkers around him represents a vision that can offer Muslims at least pause for thought. So obviously he's not saying that xenophobia or racism is a good thing. But he is saying that uh, there's something in Abula's uh, uh, thinking and his logic, uh, his sort of anti-modernity, uh, that's important at this uh, at this moment in time. And um, I can't speak for Sheikh Murad, obviously, but uh, uh, from 
from listening to what he's uh, uh, been saying for quite some time. Uh, it seems that he feels, and I think in a way quite rightly, that there, there's a certain limit to modernity, that progress cannot progress forever. There's just going to be an end to progress. And uh, by constantly pushing progress as a good thing, we need more progress, and never really thinking about what might be the downside of, uh, of this. Uh, it can be a quite a destructive thing. So, so originally, today, um, the left is very um, interested in ecology and the environment. And 50 years ago, it was the, the right that was interested in, in, uh, in the environment and ecology. <laughs> And in a way, that kind of makes more sense because if you want to conserve nature, that's obviously a conservative and uh, in a way right-wing thing to do. And so if you have progress, let's say in terms of building, then can you build forever to the point where you have no more nature? And you can't really. And so, you know, obviously the left and the right as terms of uh, sort of run out of meaning anyway. Uh, what the left believes today didn't yesterday, and the same with the right. And they sometimes spiral ra around uh, one day believing this and the next day believing what the uh, opposition uh, used to say. And again, and again it depends on, uh, uh, on context as well. So you know, the right tends to be against gay rights in America, but for gay rights in Iran, and then vice versa with the left. So uh, Sheikh Murad is sort of an interesting person. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, a lot of people in Europe are deeply uneasy because they don't necessarily want, uh, they don't necessarily want to have only that, the meaningless of modernity. We also feel it, the flatness of modernity. Uh, we know that we've lost something, and we have this awkward, anxious sense that perhaps what we've lost is actually what is the most important thing and that everything else is just a papering over of that increasingly vast crack between uh, meaning and uh, non-meaning of the, of the modern world, sort of being sucked into pop music and pop culture, which is sort of endless entertainment, but uh, of no real substance. And uh, getting to Ebola, he says, uh, so the present-day advocates of Ebola attempt to ride the tiger. They want to try to form, they want to try to find forms whereby the world can be re-sacralized. It is because they are deeply uneasy about what they are, where they are going, the political elites that, that, that are leading them to more and more blandness, away from tradition. So, how is the sort of anti-modernity uh, manifesting. So on the one hand, you have uh, some political parties and certain political thinkers uh, in uh, Salafi movement is an anti-modern movement. The Hare Krishnas, to a large extent, is an anti-modern movement. Hare Krishnas is a is a Hindu sect essentially. Um, uh, in regards to Freemasonry. Uh, it has to be, we should acknowledge that uh, there's actually been uh, some sort of anti-Masonic uh, propaganda in, in that world. And um, before we go on, I should say that uh, we, we often talk about uh, Islamic extremists or Islamists, and uh, I'm not sure in a way how helpful that is, because Islam is interpreted in different ways by different people, and uh, le legitimately so in many cases. Um, but when I look at uh, what, what Muslims themselves are saying, they often refer to uh, groups such as ISIS or Daesh as uh, attack theories, um, which is perhaps a better name. So attack theory is someone who says uh, that they have the power to say who is and who is not a Muslim. And uh, uh, that, is, I mean, that, is, that is pretty uh, new in Islam. But uh, with that comes uh, the possibility of doing violence to uh, those you say are, are not Muslims. Uh, but this is a, an extreme, and, and in a way modernist uh, interpretation of Islam. But uh, just to uh, give a, a couple of incidences, uh, there was um, a terrorist attack in Istanbul, in Turkey, in a Masonic building in 2004. 
and uh, well, two people died. One of them was the attacker. It was, a, I think, a three different um, terrorists who uh, broke into the building or forced their way into the building and uh, sprayed the dining hall with bullets and tried to uh, let off uh, a bomb. And uh, the waiter was killed and one of the uh, attackers was killed. And uh, I'm sure that uh, many of you saw in uh, January there was a um, uh, foiled uh, terrorist attempt on a Milwaukee Masonic Lodge as well. And um, I think those are the, probably the two most extreme uh, acts of that kind. Uh, certainly anti-Masonic rhetoric is uh, uh, very prevalent in that uh, the literature of those movements. Uh, it was in, uh, Al-Qaeda has its uh, own magazine called Inspire, uh, which you can find online, but I wouldn't recommend looking it up. But, um, uh, yes, I mean, the, the, the first issue took actually two years to come out because uh, it, it includes, I think, well over 100 illustrations. It's an absolutely enormous. And uh, it's, a, it's quite a labor of love for somebody, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's sort of, um, I like to think of it as uh, jihad for the Martha Stewart generation <laughs> because it's sort of, um, like there's one article in there called How to Build a Bomb in Your Mom's Kitchen. It's sort of, uh, it's a little, it's a little wacky, it has to be said. But even in there, there is one article where they praise um, some uh, uh, terrorists for allegedly killing uh, Masons in Armagh. And you find it, uh, which is probably not true, but this is what they're talking about. But, and you find references to this in, uh, in various literature. Um, it comes from um, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, uh, which some of you have not, you know. Yeah, so the Protocols of the Elders of Zion was written at the end of the 19th century. Um, it was compiled from various texts and different books. Uh, it's uh, usually thought of as an anti-Semitic uh, uh, forgery or crucifixions, it's called it a fake. Uh, basically it claims that, um, it claims to be the minutes of uh, a group of Zionists that are secretly trying to take over the world and, uh, and, and doing things such as getting rid of monarchs and uh, replacing them with democracy, which is a more uh, a sneakier form of, uh, of oppression. And um, there is one chapter in there that talks about uh, Freemasonry and uh, suggests that Freemasons are essentially the lackeys of the Zionists. And th this was a, this text was in, uh, was translated into Arabic uh, in the 1920s and uh, still shows up in, in Arabic text today sometimes. Uh, it was, I, I would suspect that it still is, but certainly a few years ago it was uh, taught as part of the uh, Saudi Arabian education curriculum uh, for boys. So quite a few people are learning that in Saudi Arabia. And it's also in the, uh, the Hamas Charter as well, which you can find online in English version. So, so it's quite widespread. And it does turn up in various news reports as well, where you know some group has said the Freemasons are very dangerous. Or sometimes they even uh, accuse the Lions, uh, the Lions Club or the Rotary Club in this sort of thing. But, um, so, so, that's, so that's another way that uh, the sort of anti-modernism is, uh, is uh, rearing its head, so both in the West and the East. And it's sort of interesting that both of these movements uh, tend, to, tend to be anti-Masonic. It goes back to the, the protocols, of course. Uh, and you know, I'm sure that they don't like the idea that there's a semi-secret group, or, or as they see it, uh, an entirely secret group. But, uh, but that's the origin of that, that particular mythology. <coughs> and uh, and, and Ebola himself actually wrote about uh, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and he also wrote about uh, Freemasonry in a very negative way, uh, sort of um, repeating what the uh, Protocols claimed, and claiming there was a, an occult war between the sort of traditionalists and the sort of demo democratic uh, West. But um, it's uh, not all bad news, it has to be said. So uh, there are other traditionalists around, and uh, they're not all of that vein. And perhaps uh, the best known traditionalist in the world, and uh, someone who is definitely not uh, xenophobic in any way, is actually uh, Prince Charles, who is the uh, current heir to the uh, British throne. 
uh, whether he'll ever be gang or not. You know. <laughs> but, uh, but he is actually uh, strongly influenced by traditionalism. Um, he has various projects that are influenced by traditionalism, uh, such as uh, uh, trying to um, make architecture more livable and less sort of modern looking, more tra using more traditional uh, materials and this sort of thing. Uh, I don't know if you saw, but he wrote a book or co-wrote a book uh, called Harmony a few years ago. Uh, it's, it's, you, you probably didn't like it. It's, in a way, it's a slightly new agey book. It talks about all the different religions, uh, sacred geometry, uh, sort of esotericism, maybe without using that word. It talks about alchemy. It talks about a lot of things uh, that you would not necessarily think uh, an heir to the British throne would be talking about in public. And um, uh, actually, the first sentence of the book is, this is a call to revolution, which is uh, not really a thing that princes normally do. But, uh, <laughs> but it's interesting. And um, so he, he, as well, is somebody who's very anti-modern and traditionalist. But he, he is, uh, in a way, very pro-Islam. Or at least he's very pro-Islamic uh, spirituality, uh, and he, especially Sufism. So, and um, in the last few years, in particular, uh, he's definitely tried to reconcile uh, the West to Islam um, by pointing out that okay, we see these uh, terrorist attacks, <coughs> but that's not the essence of the religion. So, but um, it, it may seem kind of incredible that that he's influenced by uh, gain on and traditionalism. But he actually gave a, a, a talk uh, uh, via video link, to, which was being held in, the conference being held in Alberta, Canada, in uh, 2006. And um, if you don't sort of pick up on the traditionalist vibe of uh, his book Harmony, um, uh, he makes it pretty clear in his, uh, in his introduction, uh, his address to the, to the conference. And uh, of uh, traditional, and he says uh, that it, they talk of a uh, quote, critique of the false premises of modernity, a critique set out in one of the seminal texts of the traditionalists, René Guénon's The Reign of Quantity, unquote. So he's certainly familiar with uh, traditionalism, there's no, no doubting it. Uh, he often does speak at traditionalist conferences and is associated with it quite significantly. He contributes to uh, traditionalist journals as well. Traditionalist journals are not, uh, you're not gonna get them in a local magazine store. They're sort of a little bit more under the radar, even though some, um, some sort of spiritual magazines. But um, just to give you a couple of other uh, quotes from his, com uh, his introduction, he says, uh, speaking of the traditionalists, uh, theirs is not a nostalgia for the past, but a yearning for the sacred and if they defend the past, it is because in the pre-modern world, all civilizations are marked by the presence of the sacred." Unquote. And he also says again, uh, in these uprooted times, there is a great need for constancy, a need for those who can rise above the clamor, the din, and the sheer pace of our lives to help us rediscover those truths that are immutable and eternal, a need for those who can speak of that eternal wisdom which is called the perennial philosophy. And the perennial philosophy is another name for uh, traditionalism. Um, so in regard to um, the sort of spectrum of traditionalism, it's quite broad. So on the one hand, you do have, um, for example, in Europe, uh, Jobbik, which is a Hungarian party, that uh, mo most people would say is far right, if not, <clears throat> if not extreme right. And on the other hand, you have somebody like uh, Prince Charles, who's sort of pro-environmentalist, uh, very pro-Islam, so very in favor of religion and, and the religions in general, who's interested in Sufism and uh, spirituality. So it's uh, uh, this movement of traditionalism so which has different manifestations that are in a way quite contradictory. Because uh, you know, some, uh, say, far-right parties might be extremely opposed to Islam, but then uh, you have somebody like uh, uh, Charles, who is very pro-Islam. And traditionally, a lot of the uh, traditionalist thinkers were uh, pro-Islam. 
Um, I just wanted to sort of wrap up by uh, looking at uh, a couple of Muslim thinkers who uh, we, so we, you know, we see a lot of uh, bad news on the television and a lot of uh, extreme rhetoric uh, we sometimes come across. But uh, that's not, uh, that's not that's all that's out there, it has to be said. Um, although not a traditionalist at all, um, this, this idea that the, the different re uh, religions uh, in some way are uh, connected is, uh, it can also be found in Islam uh, sometimes. So for, uh, a couple of years ago, um, when the, uh, the attacks on the Yazidis and the uh, Christians in Iraq was occurring and causing uh, quite a lot of um, uh, sensational uh, and very disturbing reporting, uh, there was um, uh, the Iranian Grand Ayatollah, Alavi Gogani, um, actually spoke about it, uh, maybe in a slightly subtle way, but uh, he said, uh, Quote, we should not think that unity is only for Muslims, but God wants us to have unity with other religions as well, unquote. And then he says again, unity is the path of God and is against the goal of Satan to create differences among mankind. Today we witness these actions of those who have murdered and pillaged in the name of Islam. Their actions in cursing other religions and sects are not compatible with Islamic logic, unquote. So he is saying that uh, other religions need to be respected. There also needs to be unity among the religions. And bear in mind, this is an uh, Iranian ayatollah. It's not some some uh, imam who was, uh, you know, got into it through Sufism and got into Sufism through New Age spirituality. I mean, it's uh, this is a serious and respected uh, ayatollah. Um, there are other Muslim thinkers as well, of course, who are trying to uh, present Islam to Muslims uh, as a spirituality. Um, uh, among them is uh, Tariq Ramadan, who's a controversial thinker. Uh, his grandfather was the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, which sort of makes him a bit of a target when perhaps he shouldn't be. Uh, Yasser Akadi, uh, who, who is an American, um, he's a very uh, interesting and uh, thoughtful uh, Muslim theologian uh, who often talks about spirituality and so on. Uh, uh, Hamza Yusuf is another American uh, uh, Muslim theologian who, if you if you don't know him, uh, you should look him up. Uh, he talks a lot about uh, terrorism and why Islam is not uh, about terrorism and is opposed to terrorism. And uh, there's also uh, Another Muslim, uh, among others, of course, called uh, Mahdi Ishmael Mank, who um, also talks about Islam in regard to spirituality and, and personal uh, behavior. And I think what all of those uh, those uh, thinkers have in common is that they see Islam as something that you apply to yourself, rather than something that you apply to uh, other people. Um, so I'm going to wrap up just with this quote by uh, another Iranian. Uh, I think uh, Alama Saeed Muhammad Hussein Tabatabai, um, which I think is a, 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 a quote that uh, a lot of people here will um, uh, agree with. And again, he's a, an Iranian uh, uh, thinker and theologian uh, of, uh, who's well respected. Um, and he said, uh, we must not consider Gnosis as a religion among others, but as the heart of all religions. Gnosis is the one path of worship. Of what, Gnosis is one of the paths of worship, a path based on knowledge combined with love rather than fear. It is the path for realizing the inner truth of religion rather than remaining satisfied only with this external and rational thought. So, that's, I think that's something that uh, we in the West who are at least serious about uh, spirituality, and not in a sort of popular sense, can uh, can certainly agree with that there is a kind of gnosis at the heart of religion. Obviously, it's something uh, you need to work seriously towards. But I think it's also interesting that he says that not to be satisfied with the external and uh, rational thought. Uh, rational thinking is something that we uh, that we elevate 
and think is the only way of uh, looking at the world. Uh, there was actually a Masonic, uh, uh, let's say an author on, uh, on Freemasonry who uh, a few months ago was saying that uh, rational thinking was basically the, the best way of thinking and, uh, and that Freemasonry was about teaching rational thought, which is completely ludicrous. Um, <laughs> not least of all because uh, you don't teach rational thinking through secrets and esotericism and rituals and dramas. There's not a lot of rational there, which is not to say that you can't be rational about it and think rationally about things, but clearly rational thinking is not, in my opinion, it's not the, the highest way of thinking. Most people don't even think rationally, they simply rationalize. So, but to, to sum up, so, so today we do see a kind of anti-modern movement across the world, really, and it has uh, some, some, some very good aspects to it especially with someone like Prince Charles. Um, ecology, the unity of religion, gnosis, uh, spirituality, but it also has uh, much darker shadows as well. Um, as Sheikh Murad would say, uh, uh, xenophobia and racism, and also, of course, uh, terrorism and so on. But, uh, so in a way, you can ask uh, maybe what is Freemasonry's role in, in, in the world today in relation to that. And uh, oh, historically, of course, Gaynon, who uh, founded Freemasonry, uh, founded traditionalism, was involved with uh, fringe masonry of various sorts and uh, related movements. But uh, the question may be, what is, what is uh, Freemasonry? And Freemasonry, in a certain sense, is an kind of anti-modern movement. Uh, most people think of it as progressive, uh, voting, equality, and so on, which is completely true. But it also has another side as well, which is uh, uh, looking at oneself and self-improvement, uh, especially through uh, the motif of uh, death and God and uh, personal behavior and this sort of thing, and things that are really not very fashionable anymore. So. Um, it's, uh, I think, in a way, kind of an interesting time for Freemasons. The, the, they are, in a way, in, in involved in a, in a movement that, that is, at least to some extent, sort of anti-modern. But uh, yet, at the same time, it's very much caught in the, uh, in the uh, headlights of uh, movements that are themselves entirely anti-modern, but which see Freemasonry as the most progressive sort of enemy of theirs imaginable. And in some cases, have been violently attacked. But that, I think, that brings it to a point. Yes. Um, the point I have, maybe academic on what you said, but um, traditionalism, you've used it nearly interchangeably with. Anti-modernist, and I don't think yeah. I don't. I think it's because the the, the issue is uh, looking back at history is inevitable, sort of like theology. Even if you're an atheist, there this is a, 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 yeah. a theological side or a form of worship to some degree or in a certain way. So it's uh, what makes traditionalism what it is. Maybe the way it approaches history, <coughs> it's, it's the way it refers to history, rather than simply being inspired by people. It's it's. Uh, uses it for admonition, maybe for uh, expulsion, maybe for acceptance, rejection, but it's still based on, even the most modernist is still based somehow on history, because history is memory and is cumulative knowledge, so you cannot work without it. Yeah, well, I mean, a, a couple of things. I mean, that's true, but uh, I think traditionalism is not necessarily, or at least it would not claim that it is a backward-looking movement, looking always at history. So it, it would, I suppose, claim that it is a, uh, looking at things that are outside of history. So uh, it does not want to go back to a more conservative culture, per se, although that may be the result, but that it wants to go back to the primordial tradition or to understand the primordial revelation. So a, tr a true tr traditionalist would not necessarily want to go back to something that looked like the 1950s or the 1900s or even the 1800s, but would want to go back to, uh, to or at least maybe you need to go forward 
to understand the, what is the primordial revelation. So in, in that sense, he would move into a religion such as Islam or Christianity or Judaism or Buddhism, perhaps. Not to become a convert as such, or at least not in the usual sense, but to practice the, the rituals and to adopt the ideas, but with the idea that this itself is a reflection of a primordial revelation that came much earlier on, and this is a kind of a, basically a reflection or a shadow of it. But um, in regard to anti-modernism, so it's, it's definitely in your right, not the case that uh, traditionalists are necessarily anti-modern, but there are uh, plenty of movements uh, out there that are anti-modern that claim in some respects to be traditionalist, and some claim outright to be traditionalist. But um, uh, whether they're traditionalist or not, uh, that's open to debate. And I would say that um, people should be able to do with whatever the, uh, their conscience says. But um, I think if you look at uh, some traditional or quote, quote unquote traditionalist websites that are more along sort of racialist lines. Uh, they are fascinated by IQ and this sort of thing. And to me, this is completely anti-traditionalist. I, and I, I don't claim to be a traditionalist myself. But um, if you look at uh, uh, sort of different uh, ways of uh, being throughout history, such as uh, more classical Chinese culture or something like that, uh, people, certain people anyway, the more upper class people usually it has to be said, elevated themselves through adopting uh, you know, some kind of martial art such as archery, uh, studying uh, philosophy, uh, studying and practicing uh, other arts such as calligraphy and painting, and trying to develop the whole person uh, with an understanding of, uh, of society and uh, culture, in the, the culture itself, uh, such as the, the worship of ancestors and so on. But, uh, but I don't think, um, personally, that they were particularly bothered about uh, IQ as such. This is just like a tiny, uh, a tiny portion of us, really, if IQ is even accurate. Um, and, but we've become obsessed with the idea of uh, intelligence, really. And I think that this is actually very unhealthy. Um, you know, do I want intelligent friends? I do, but I also want friends that, uh, that do things and actually live a life that's uh, meaningful, uh, practicing some kind of martial art, maybe painting, uh, studying religion and spirituality. And that to me is a way much more important. Uh, today we're, we're very fragmented, and we sort of feel that if I just do one or two things, then I'm gonna be fine. But uh, that's definitely not the traditional way of doing things. But in regards to anti-modern, yeah, there are these uh, groups out there that would claim that they are traditionalists, but they're actually um, anti-modern. And they usually, uh, they usually are not so interested in the uh, primordial revelation. Uh, they usually are much more interested, ultimately, in, uh, in going back sort of 20 or 30 or 40 years. So, so that's how I meant it. Yes, certainly. You mentioned about the constant clash between traditionalism and modern, modernism. Right? Yeah. Freemasonry being a traditionalist uh, movement, uh, you know, as, as, as it progresses through, um, you know, through history, what are your views in terms of how Freemasonry can sustain its essence and purpose in spite of the pressures of modernism? Yeah. Yeah, so that's interesting, right? So, uh, Freemasonry as an institution is obviously, um, feels the pressure of modernity, um, just as any other organization does. And sometimes, you know, the pressure of modernity is actually a good thing, and sometimes it's uh, maybe not such a good thing. Um, I think if you uh, take the example of uh, the writer on Freemasonry that I mentioned, who thinks that Freemasonry is all about promoting rational thought, I think that's uh, an obvious example of uh, the pressure of modernity having a, a bad effect. You know, if people uh, want to study rational thought, you should do that, but uh, you shouldn't think that rituals and secrets and this sort of thing has anything to do with rational thinking. And um, 
it's sort of sort of a bit of a tangent, I know, but uh, um, there was a, a book put out a few years ago claiming that uh, the uh, German philosopher Georg Hegel was a was a Freemason. But actually, if you read what Hegel says, he's, in my opinion, so sort of rapidly anti-Masonic. And, and one of the reasons he is is that um, is that he feels that Freemasonry is a kind of throwback to an earlier time. The, the, the human consciousness or the world spirit, as he would call it, has um, moved past the point where we need rituals and where we need, uh, well, particularly rituals, but theater and art and this kind of thing. Because what you can express through those things, uh, Hegel would say, is, um, is limited, whereas the rational mind just keeps uh, thinking and thinking and thinking through things and going further and further without, without any kind of without any kind of end, really. But uh, the, pr the problem with that is that uh, a life that's based on allegedly rational thinking, which usually means just rationalizing, is ultimately not, not going to be very fulfilling, because it's going to mean no art, no music, no rituals, uh, no sort of distinguishing clothing. You wouldn't be interested in anything aesthetically. Why when, uh, spirituality as well? Why meditate if you can just think rationally about something? So basically, the whole of life is just eradicated. But um, in regards to, uh, to your question, uh, what can Freemasonry do to avoid the pressures of modernity? Well, <clears throat> it probably won't avoid the pressures of modernity. Uh, not always, anyway. But uh, and you know, the fraternity has um, has uh, adopted certain elements of modernity. That are actually good, right? So there's no discrimination in terms of uh, male men being able to join. And if one is a, a Sufi Muslim and the other one is a, a Christian and the other one is Jewish and another Hindu, it's no big deal. And maybe today out in the world that's um, that's more common, but it's still pretty unusual. And it's very unusual if it's going to be in a kind of spiritual or or kind of religious environment. Um, so, you know, modernity did something good, and uh, both Freemasonry has kept the focus on the individual itself. But um, I think the Freemasonry, uh, there's a lot of discussion about what Freemasonry can do to keep itself being popular, uh, which may not be possible. But um, there are all these kind of theories about what should be done. Uh, what kind of entertainment should there be, and this sort of thing. Uh, but ultimately, Freemasonry just has to do Freemasonry. It just has to make sure what it does is of high quality. It gets in the right people. It makes it an interesting experience. Uh, Freemasonry, symbolism, uh, rituals, spirituality, this should all be the focus of a Masonic Lodge. And if it is the focus of a Masonic Lodge, then Freemasonry will survive. And if it's not, then it won't. I mean, I go to a martial arts uh, school, and if I went there, um, four out of five times, there was no martial arts, but there was a lot of talk about uh, finances and this sort of thing, and stuff I couldn't care less about. Well, then I wouldn't go, and this is why logic was done. So in a way, like everything else, it just has to be true to itself. Maybe we'll have to adapt. Maybe we won't. But uh, you know, but it has to it has to do Freemasonry, really. I mean, whether that will mean eventually. Uh, I mean, obviously, a few months ago there was a big debate: should uh, gay men be allowed in? Of course, here uh, in this jurisdiction, gay men uh, join. It's no big deal. Gay men. I'm sure gay men have been Freemasons for centuries. <laughs> <laughs> One imagines. And uh, maybe eventually, uh, maybe maybe there will be women joining. I, I don't know. Maybe it would be okay. Maybe it will, but you know, it's a bad, But you know, as long as it stays true to itself, then it's going to be okay. <coughs> yes. Although I'm tempted to uh, to jump in headlong into the uh, archaic revival versus modernism yeah. uh, through the lens of Masonic principles, uh, I'll ask you something a little bit uh, further off center on that. Um, you had mentioned earlier the topic of riding the tiger, yeah. which was interpreted by yourself and, and probably others in a certain way, which is you know uh, perhaps one direction. But it occurs to me maybe there's um, 
would, would you think maybe there's alternate meanings behind that? You mentioned a couple of things that you could easily uh, look into Taoist approach or even from an alchemical aspect. Do you see any other yeah. potential meaning behind that? Well, I think that's how Evola meant it, that we're supposed to just ride this beast of modernity until it's exhausted. But, sure, you could see other meaning into it, yeah. And, I mean, I wouldn't want to tell you what they are, but, sure, I mean, if, and any, anyone who has any kind of practice, right, whether it's Freemasonry or martial arts or Sufism or Taoism, is naturally going to, going to interpret these things in another way. So, so in that sense, yeah. Okay, it's very long. Yes. It has been, it seems to be the received wisdom in this company that Freemasonry is a traditionalist movement. I'd like to offer a counter perspective. I think that Freemasonry is picky. I think that in some ways it holds very traditionalist values, you know, the four cardinal virtues, um, hearkening back to a volume of the sacred law, very much not a modern thing. But on the other hand, perhaps because Freemasonry has a very diverse set of roots, or its roots are set in very diverse soil for one tree. It also, as you pointed out, um, I, wouldn't, I don't know that it's absorbed some aspects of modernity so much as created them. The idea right, right. of uh, everyone being on the level, and it not being a problem if the butcher is sitting next to the baker is sitting next to the vicar is sitting next to the prince. That the idea of all those folks, the, those different levels of society, being in one organization, the different religions, different ethnic groups, different races, being in one organization, is most definitely not traditional in any way. No, no, you might consider it primordial, although that's a bit of a stretch, or you know that's taking it all to a higher octave. But, but I, I wonder how you'd react to that thought that that Freemasonry is picky with regards to both traditionalism and modernity. Yeah, I don't know if it's picky, but it, I mean it's certainly true that there are traditional elements and there are elements that are more modern. Uh, you know, I mentioned uh, you know I mentioned myself that. Uh, Different religions, yes, people yeah. of different religions are members, which you know is, is, is not radical now, but it was radical at some and point. Here again, I want to underline the idea. I don't know that those ideas came in with modernity. I think that Freemasonry helped create it and create that environment, yeah. and and thereby injected it into modernity. Yeah, I mean, there's there's an argument for that for sure, and. You know, at one point, Freemasonry was exceptionally influential, especially in you know, certain circles, that, that may have had a, an influence on the culture. The Bill of Rights. Yeah, right, exactly, yeah. So, yeah, for sure, that's true. Yes. yes. Um, what martial arts do you practice? I practice <laughs> Kung Fu. Oh, okay. It's very traditional. Kung Fu or Wing Chun? It's neither. It's yeah, I mean, I've done the traditional martial arts. I do now the modern martial arts. Oh, okay. It's funny, like, yeah, it's a, obviously a clash in the martial arts world. Yeah, there is. That's okay. Yes. Sorry. So I was curious uh, about uh, your thoughts on Sikhism, as it is a philosophy that seems both kind of uh, modernist and anti modernist, in that it kind of has a view of like a universal God that has existed throughout religions, but at the same time it also advocates social justice and equality for women, and I'm just curious, like uh, like where does one draw the line on what is modern that is beneficial, and what is traditional that is beneficial, and kind of how things kind of collide to that? Yeah, well Sikhism I don't know enough about to comment on, to be honest with you. I only know the most elementary aspects of it, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to comment on that. But um, so your, your, the second part of your question was, what, which, how do you know what in tradition and what in modernity is beneficial? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think that um, 
regardless of whether this is beneficial or that is beneficial, I think the idea is to uh, focus on one's own behavior rather than the behavior of other people, I would say. And I think that today, this is just my opinion, but I think today that uh, there seems to be a real emphasis on focusing on the behavior of other people whether they're right or wrong. Which political party are they voting for? And if it's the wrong one, then they should be denounced and this sort of thing. And I think this is just, a, quite frankly, appalling. And uh, it's not just because um, uh, political parties whip up uh, hysteria, though they do, because they want votes, obviously, of both sides. But I think it's just a part of our culture that you know somebody with a block wants to get attention. So if they're sort of screaming and crying and being fanatical, and, uh, making outrageous statements or saying that they're traumatically uh, hurt by something, then they're going to get a thousand views that day as opposed to ten views that day. So there's a, you know, as a culture, uh, fame is a temptation, right? And, um, but I would say in regard to what aspects of tradition and modernity are useful, uh, I would say it's those aspects that uh, keep you focused on your behavior and not other people's behavior. So, yes? In societies where uh, anti-modernism uh, rules, and Freemasonry exists, whether it's legal or not, does Freemasonry act as a sort of safe space for religions as it does here, where you would find you know, Egyptian, Egyptian Coptic Christians meeting with Muslims in, in Egypt, or Sunnis and Shias? Does it, does it serve that same role in, in, those, in those countries? Yeah, I would say not. In most uh, most Muslim majority countries, uh, Freemasonry is banned for one thing. Um, in the, I'm not sure about other countries such as Russia, but uh, I suspect there it's mostly Christian. And then some in some countries, Freemasonry is 100% uh, Christian. So even Freemasonry has quite a, a diverse range within it. So some grand lodges promote atheism essentially, and others restricted to Christianity. But uh, in most modern anti-modern societies, uh, Freemasonry is not big. So. Are there any other questions tonight? Mm -hmm. well, please join me in this.